Before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit about my current perspective and what I'm currently doing. Uh, I left Google a year and a half ago. Google is a place that has lots of great Java infrastructure in place. And I left for uh, a small startup where we had to build all the infrastructure from scratch. So for over the last year and a half, I've been somewhat of a Java noob and gotten to see everything through the eyes of someone who's new to Java. Um, Square is also largely, at least on the server side, uh, a Ruby and Rails shop. Um, so uh, I've also uh, programmed, uh, learned R Ruby and Rails this year quite a bit, and I'll, I'll program quite a bit of code in that. So I'm going to be comparing that. Um, so there was a time when Java was the platform du jour. I don't know how many people remember that. Um, and I think that now what I'm kind of seeing is that there's this uh, renewed interest that's coming. And that presumes that there was at some point when the interest waned and what happened? Why did that happen? Um, for me, it was, uh, I think it was 2004 happened. Uh, how many of you remember struts? And uh, I just have one word for you, Dyna action form. Um, well, in 2004, uh, I, you know, I was a consultant, and Struts was the number one web framework, and there were, you pretty much weren't allowed to use anything else. Um, and to make matters worse, uh, when things should have gotten simpler, they, they actually got more complex when in March, uh, JSF 1.0 was released, and uh, if you've ever used that, then you know, uh, compared to Ruby and Rails, how, how terrible that can be. Um, then in July, uh, this guy named Dave, David Heimler Hansen drove a big truck through the gaping hole that we left when he open sourced Rails um, and introduced the simple web framework that, uh, that we all really actually needed and got rid of all that boilerplate code and, uh, that, that we were writing. Um, well, in September, Java 5 was released, and Java 5 was very significant for me, and it's really the reason that I, I actually stuck with the Java platform. It introduced a couple very interesting features, namely uh, generics and annotations that uh, went on to enable us to program in a, com a completely different way and made Java actually uh, uh, competitive again. Um, but the reality is that the frameworks took uh, a couple years to catch up. And I'm specifically thinking of JPA, which took about two years, and then also uh, if you think like Juice, which is very annotation, heavily annotation-based, and JAX-RS, which I think is uh, kind of the Java web framework du jour today. Um, it also it came along about two and a half years later, uh, which gave Rails plenty of, of time to mature. And you know, I love Rails, don't get me wrong. Uh, so it was a little too late, and you know, there's this momentum uh, to Mindshare and this momentum of early adopters, and they were all out looking for new things already um, and not waiting around for that two and a half years for uh, Java to catch up. Um, so why now? Where is this new interest coming from? Um, I, the main driver that I see is scalability. And uh, so what this boils down to is that you can only throw so much hardware at a problem. You've all heard that axiom, throw more hardware at it and just keep the development easy. But the reality of deploying a, a Rails app is that even on like an enterprise class machine when you're running like MRI Ruby like we do, um, you, you can only have like 10 to 20 workers, which means you can only process uh, 10 to 20 concurrent requests per second, or, or uh, 10 to 20 current requests. So compare that to uh, what the JVM enables and where you can do hundreds, thousands, and even with really cool new technologies like Netty, you can even like handle un like 100,000 concurrent connections. So we're not talking just uh, that it's like, you know, it's like twice as slow or something like that. We're really talking about an order of magnitude or two. Um, and then we're not just talking hardware anymore, we're talking about kind of the uh, operational expense. Um, and you're talking about, uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna deploy 10 servers or 100 or 1,000 servers? Obviously, uh, 10's a, a lot cheaper and you, know, you don't have to pay that continuous operational tax. Um, there's also this matter of uh, latency. You can throw more hardware at a problem and that enables you to scale horizontally and increase your throughput, uh, but it doesn't uh, enable you to go be below that uh, performance floor that you see um, on some platforms. Uh, and so, for example, one uh, technique that's popular nowadays is to uh, uh, process requests uh, concurrently. That is to say, you have uh, multiple threads all going out to different servers at once and all handling a single request concurrently. So, uh, is JRuby the answer? And uh, we have quite a bit, we have a bit of experience here. Um, we haven't uh, moved over our uh, current Rails app yet, 
um, because it's, it, anybody who has tried this knows that that's a bit challenging given if you have like native dependencies and that sort of thing. But we have built some uh, greenfield apps and deployed them on Ruby. And uh, in one in particular, like we used Sinatra and Active Record. Um, and we actually had some interesting experiences there when we went to load test it, as you should always do. Um, we actually saw uh, uh, queries returning the results from completely different queries. And this manifested itself in the worst way possible. In our case, it was actually returning the wrong credit card numbers. Um, so I guess the moral of this story is that uh, concurrency is indeed rocket science. And um, the, in our particular case, what ended up happening was there was a minor concurrency bug, uh, well, I guess major, uh, in active record. And it was like all the way down in some crazy uh, AST that it was constructing when it was constructing queries. And they had just like a little bit of shared state. Um, anybody who's programmed Java for a long time knows that concurrency is really hard. And no matter how, even though we think about it, we still have concurrency bugs. Well, I, I think that the Ruby world and Ruby library, library developers have thought about it a lot less and they're a lot newer to it. So you're even more prone to run into problems. Um, there's also uh, kind of another issue uh, that I've seen people run into. Uh, Ruby talent is really tough to come by, um, so tough uh, that uh, we actually don't look for Ruby developers anymore. We look specifically for generalists, just what I call great athletes, people who are just really great programmers, and then we teach them Ruby. And you know, I've talked to people at uh, other companies, Twitter and LinkedIn, who kind of share this sentiment. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Android. I think this is one of the most exciting technologies in this space today, and it's by and large attracting more people to the Java programming language than any other technology. So what's next? What is going to kind of continue this renaissance and keep people, uh, keep us coming to the Java platform? Um, the first thing that I'm really excited about is Invoke Dynamic. Uh, this is launched in Java 7, which is coming out any day now. Uh, the really interesting thing about Java, uh, Invoke Dynamic is that this is the first time that, well, it's the first time that the JVM has significantly changed in a really long time. This is the first time that the ch JVM has changed independently of the programming language. And what does that mean? It means that Invoke Dynamic is a feature of the JVM, but it really has no analog in the Java programming language. The whole purpose of Invoke Dynamic is to enable other programming languages like Ruby, JavaScript, and Python. And the really cool thing is that it enables these languages to uh, take advantage of Java's hotspot compiler and its performance benefits and hook directly into it with relatively little effort. Little effort, especially compared to them writing their own JIT compiler for every single platform. Um, and it's enabling them, to, like Ruby and Python and JavaScript, to benefit from this, like, m the man millennia of effort that's gone into the hotspot compiler. It's truly brilliant, and it's, I'm really, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Uh, the next thing is this, these are actually coming in Java 8 are closures and extension methods. Uh, extension methods, if you don't know, they enable kind of like, um, yeah, you can kind of maybe uh, liken them to traits or mixins or that sort of thing. Uh, that is to say, both of these features uh, enable us to get rid of tons of boilerplate code. Yes, the Java programming language is a little late to the game uh, in, in, uh, in these areas, but the the, on the plus side of that is that Java was able to learn from kind of the traps and pitfalls of all these other languages like Ruby and C Sharp and Scala. So in the meantime, what can we do to kind of catalyze or keep this uh, momentum going? Um, like I said at the beginning of this talk, uh, I, I feel like kind of a newbie to Java in the sense that you know I've had to go and discover uh, all these new infrastructure technologies and build this build up my stack um, and the same uh, on the Ruby side. And one of the things that I found really striking is just how much more how much better designed and usable and non crufty uh, the Ruby community websites are. You know, you just go to the, their, any site for any technology and it's beautifully designed and you can immediately find what you need. Whereas with a Java website, it's, it tends to be some kind of like Maven automatically generated template and I can never find what I'm looking for if the website is even up. And then there's all these crufty websites, you know, from like 12 years ago that are confusing new users and that we should probably take down or just put big banners across and say, don't use this. <laughs> So there is one open question that uh, remains in my mind, and that is, is Java open? And this is the, maybe kind of the, uh, the one thing that could get in the way of this renaissance. Well, so openness is a relative term. Unfortunately, it's not black or white, um, and Java is definitely in a gray area. First, we need to differentiate between Java SE and OpenJDK. Java SE is the specification, 
and OpenJDK is the implementation. Is uh, Java SE uh, an open standard? I think the answer is obviously not. Uh, one corporation controls it, and they've even exerted that control to prevent free, independent, open implementations. Um, is OpenJDK an open source project? Well, it uses the uh, GPL v2 license, um, but it uses it in an interesting way. I kind of, you know, it's like the original intention of the GPL was to ensure freedom while it appears, it appears as though Oracle is using the GPL in this case to exert control. And I also uh, find it somewhat interesting that Oracle chose the uh, GPL v2 versus v3. Um, the key differentiation between v2 and v3 is that uh, v3 pa grants patents while v2 does not. So I, I guess the, uh, the key here is that uh, Oracle and Sun and Oracle have kind of failed to deliver on their promises. When they started off with the JCP, it was supposed to be this open organization where anyone could come and not be inhibited, they could compete on implementation, and I think they truly believed this in the beginning, um, but they attracted uh, developers like myself and contributors like myself were, con were attracted to uh, the prospect of this open platform and contributing to an open project that uh, we could do whatever we wanted with. Um, but then once uh, we built up that ecosystem and we built up all this value, because the real value in Java is in the community and all the infrastructure we've built around it, well, then uh, Oracle, Sun, and Oracle have chosen to kind of uh, scale back and close it down and uh, try to make some money off of that value that we all created. So does it matter? Um, you know, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, if Oracle can regain the trust of the uh, community that built this eco ecosystem, then Java will be great. Uh, if they can't, I suspect uh, a more open alternative will prevail. So thank you. Uh, if you enjoyed this talk, I'm Crazy Bob on Twitter, um, and also Square is hiring Rails and Java engineers, so send me an email. <laughs>